Hello, and welcome to The Monster Painter. This week, we take a look at the Dungeons & Lasers terrain kit, Land of the Giants. All right then, let's get cracking and see what is in the Land of the Giants. I got this big old box as part of a recently delivered crowdfunder campaign by Archon Studios. Delivered a couple of months early, I might add. And what earth-shaking surprise! The box is full of plastic sprues. Well then, it's time to get out the snips. So all those bottles have to be snipped off all those sprues, and there sure are a lot of sprues. It's a big fat pile, and it's gonna take a little while. So mercifully, Everything glues together with plastic glue, which makes for a quick solid bond. Most of the kit that requires any assembly at all are just two-part bits of scatter terrain. A couple of the models are more elaborate with multi-parts, the head, the big head, and the big hand. Archon Studio provides one of those things on the package you can scan to get online directions. I prefer to treat them like small puzzles, figuring them out, dry fitting them together, and then breaking out the glue. I don't rush, and we all know it can be a lot of fun to assemble models. Now the marquee model in this kit has to be the big old temple. And while it is fairly simple to assemble, first you just attach the heads to the statues, and then you glue the four quarters to of the structure together and then add the floor. It is important to know that you have to trim the excess plastic off this model carefully and thoroughly. Even a little bit of plastic left behind can lead to unfortunate gaps. So be vigilant when preparing this model. Now that everything is clipped and trimmed, glued and assembled, uh, let's take a look at what we have. And it's a cavalcade of shattered ruins and toppled statuary, all of which will be perfect for my favorite game, Frostgrave, which takes place in a long abandoned ruined wizard city. I think this stuff is going to be endlessly useful for that setting. It has a very distinctive look to it, not at all reminiscent of the game's workshop house style, which I call nihilist ultra gothic. These models are well sculpted with a decidedly classical look, but one that leans heavily into the grotesque. In art historical terms, I find these models evocative of a mannerism, a European art style that arises after the Italian Renaissance and is characterized by the Renaissance legacy of neoclassical formulism and uh, the excellent technique but introduces aspects of the grotesque, distorted, and strange into the mix. And oh boy, does the crazy-looking temple ever optimize a kind of neo-mannerist style. I really like it. It is an interesting, fresh approach that will still work with all my other ruined terrain. And here is the whole lot, all primed up with acrylic gesso, my primer of choice. Onto the base coat, I used a dark gray craft paint called Wrought Iron by the brand Folk Art. There is a lot of surface area here, and I ain't made of money. Now onto the painting. And because all of the models are of broken down weathered old stone, I will be applying my reliable method for painting weathered old stone to this entire kit. The first step in the process is to dry brush on a layer of fairly dark gray. A mixture of Payne's gray and titanium white will do the job. Because of the scale of these models, I am breaking out the big brush! Not something you get to do very often when painting miniatures. And here is everything after that first step. They are nice models and you could probably get away with stopping here. But I'm going to keep on going. The next step is another dry brush layer of a lighter gray. This time a warm mixture of Payne's gray and unbleached titanium. Once again I'm using the big brush and I'm applying the paint with a lighter touch. This way I will start to build up layers of progressively lighter paint which will bring out the textures and forms of the model in a careful and methodical process. 
Uh, there's quite a lot going on in these models, and I want to bring out all that exceptional detail without making them look busy or convoluted. Once again, here is the result of this step on the whole lot. They're starting to come together, but I think they need more dry brushing. So here we go with another dry brush layer of gray. A yet lighter, warmer mixture of Payne's gray and titanium white applied with the same big brush, but with a still lighter touch. Those stony textures are coming along quite nicely now. Onto a rather time-consuming but quite rewarding step in the process. With a very light mixture of Payne's Grey and Unbleached Titanium, I will highlight all the edges of the model and some of the details, particularly the details on the statuary. This will uh, heighten the drama of the models without making them look busy or distracting. These are well-designed models that allow you to create a credible result with as little or as much detailing as you want. I'm aiming for somewhere in the middle, uh, showing off the details without pushing them into the foreground. Now, this set is billed as the Land of the Giants, but it seems clear to me that this kit depicts a ruined temple dedicated to the Elder Titan Atlas from Greek mythology. Atlas was a mighty titan and enemy of the Olympian gods, and after the defeat of the titans, Zeus cursed Atlas to hold up the sky in the far western edge of the world. He appears in the story of Perseus and has a memorable role in the Twelve Labors of Hercules. However, he was not considered a figure of veneration, and in the real world there were no temples dedicated to him. That being said, this kit seems to channel the notion that many of the Elder Titans were deities in a pre-existing -re -pre religion that was supplanted and subsumed by the arrival of Zeus and the Olympians, as that far more familiar classical mythological religion takes hold in ancient Greece. Whether this is the actual case has been lost to the clouds of prehistory, but I do really like the idea of an ancient cult of Atlas, and I will definitely be working this into my personal head canon. And here is the whole lot after this step has been completed. They are really starting to take shape, but there is still more to do. So, on some of the models, the stonework is surrounded by or embedded in earth. To these areas, I am applying a wash of raw umber a cool dark brown. This will differentiate the areas without highlighting a contrast. Many of the models have vines and creepers growing on them, as suits ancient and forgotten monuments. I have picked these details out using bronze yellow, one of my favorite colors for depicting woody vegetation. The contrast between the cool gray stone and the yellow brown of the vines is a bit sharp at this point, but it'll be calmed down in the last step. Before we get to that final step, however, there are still a few details that need to be taken care of. Now, the box art and many excellent images shared to social media show many of the details of the ruins being picked out and highlighted with metallic paint, usually gold or bronze. This can clearly be done to spectacular and dramatic effect, and is well worth doing. Personally, I feel this kind of detailing can start to make the model look a little busy and cluttered, as well as taking away from the look of ancient weathered ruins forgotten by time. Because of this, I am limiting the metallic detailing to some bronze on the symbols along the top of the temple, and some gold details on the floor of the temple. This will add some drama without sending things over the top. After all, sometimes less is more. A couple of the models, the big head and the big hand, have some extra details that need to be taken care of. The head is full of detritus, and a buzzard has made her home on top of it. And there are some plants and earth around the hand. With those uh, little details taken care of, we can head to the final step. And that final step will be applied to all of the models in this kit. It is a fairly simple one. 
I will add a thin green wash along the base of all the models, being careful to make sure that I develop a nice gradient. I'll also be adding uh, the green wash over top of all the vines. This will help kind of calm them down and help unify the models as a whole. Uh, this step is very useful and I use it to finish the vast majority of the terrain models in my collection and it has a number of benefits. First, it tends to ground the model, giving it a sense of naturalism and locating it in the environment. The other benefit is that by finishing most of my terrain this way, it helps unify the gaming table, especially when the elements of that gaming table come from a variety of sources such as Games Workshop, Reaper Miniatures, Archon Studios, and weird toys I find at the thrift store. With this complete, we can finally take a look at the final products. So, here we have it. The Land of the Giants, a sprawling 23-piece kit that runs the gamut from small bits of scatter terrain all the way up to big old set pieces that can dominate a table. The models are all quite good, they were fun to paint, and I am very pleased with the results. I can see myself getting a lot of use out of this stuff. All those smaller pieces will hit the table with great regularity. I love toppled pillars and statuary. For me, nothing says desolate ruins quite like shattered and broken statues. This kit is really perfect for my favorite game, Frostgrave, which is set in a long ruined wizard city and calls for as much terrain as you can jam on the table. All of this stuff is perfect for that high fantasy magic setting. I can see the whole kit coming together for a specific scenario where the warbands arrive to loot the ancient temple of Atlas. As well, a number of the smaller pieces have enough character to uh, play special parts in adventures and scenarios. The kit as a whole is very exciting and tactically versatile. So yes, The Land of the Giants gets a big thumbs up from me. Of all the boxes that I got in my great big Dungeons & Lasers Encounter Pledge, I think I will be getting the most use out of this one. It is absolutely chock-a-block full of interesting and useful terrain bits, and it's so very well themed for my favorite setting. The kit is much a much appreciated addition to my ever-growing haunted ruins, and it's going to be a ton of fun on the tabletop. So I, uh went to see the new Dungeons and Dragons movie, Honor Among Thieves. So, what did you think of it then? It was pretty good. They really nailed the feel of Dungeons and Dragons, and the characters are fun and well written. The action is exciting, the plot coherent, and the movie moves along at a convincing pace. There's Plenty of fan service, but it never gets in the way of the movie. Yes, yes, I agree. It was a solid movie, not a masterpiece or anything, but definitely a lot of fun and very, very watchable. Yes, yes, it's like a Marvel movie, but uh, better thought through and not as slavishly formulaic. Definitely, definitely. A much, much better film than the previous Dungeons & Dragons movies, for sure. Ah, that doesn't say much. Even the last season of Game of Thrones is better than those movies. Ah. Very true. But my main criticism of the movie 
is that it falls into the problem so common amongst the uh, A-list action adventure movies these days. The film seems to be just written to get the characters from one big elaborate flashy set piece to the next. So, uh, kind of a lot like a D&D module, eh? Hmm, perhaps. My other criticism of the movie involves the shadowy villain who is in the background pulling the strings. The evil Zas Tam, ruler of Thay and villainous Archlich. You see, back in the day, myself and a plucky band of misfit adventurers destroyed Zas Tam after a long, epic quest. It was very exciting stuff. You mean, uh... Back in 1986, when you were a little twerpy punk playing in his parents' basement? Huh? Uh, Well, I was really more of a goth than a punk back then. But yes, yes. And, um, did you destroy Zaz Tam's Falala Cree? Hmm? Falala what now? (laughs) Ah ha ha! You let him slip through your fingers. You blew it. Well, I suppose that would explain a lot of things. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's watch some monster fights. Yeah, monster fights. This week's monster fight pits a mighty badass human. A old metal chaos warrior from Games Workshop made sometime in the 1990s against an unspeakable horror I'll call Zitzo Pimple Tap. Some sort of plastic thing I found in a bag at the thrift store. And now the dice shall speak. Oh dear. That doesn't look very good. Well, let's see how this plays out. I'm gonna pop you! Everyone remain calm. Proceed to the exits. Remain calm. Dear God, there's something coming out of it! Bring, oh, bring. Oh, I'm getting bring, a phone Bring, Hello? Yeah? What? No, no, I don't have any air ducts. I only have water ducts. And they're clean. They're in the water. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y- you know what I do have? I have air chickens. And they are filthy. Could you come and clean those? They hung up. I hope they call back. Holy moly! You made it through all that nonsense! You must really want your chance to win a fabulous men's large monster painter t-shirt. Or, if your body type doesn't conform to a men's large, we have a wonderful alternative, a fabulous monster painter math rock bag. So, it's time to make the draw. Time to pull a name out of the hat. And let's see who won. Here we go. The winner is Endungeoned Mort. You won a t-shirt. You lucky guy. Congratulations, Endungeoned. I'll be getting a hold of you soon to send you your fabulous t-shirt. Next time on The Monster Painter, I dig into the Dungeons and Lasers Encounters stretch goal box. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell. Ring 
the bell. Watching less the monster painter.